Hello and welcome to Chimera, Britain's only book festival celebrating science fiction, fantasy and horror writing. My name is Anne Landman and I'm the festival's founder and artistic director. Right about now I'd hope to be welcoming you to beautiful Edinburgh, to our venue The Pleasance, for a weekend packed with events. Writing workshop panels, readings, open mics, a quiz, a Cayley, two plays, we had so much in store for you. Thank you for joining us online instead to be part of our programme from the safety of your homes. We're very excited to still bring you a fantastic lineup of speakers. We'd ask you that you support our speakers, and there's many ways you can do that. You can buy their books or borrow them from the library. You can donate to them directly via their Patreon or Coffee. You will find the links for that below in the description. We encourage you to buy a ticket for our events, even the pre-recorded ones. All ticket money will go directly to our speakers. You can also donate to the festival and all donations via the donation page will be split between our speakers once we've covered our costs like the Zoom account. Thank you again for joining us in this brave new world of digital events. We hope you have a chance to check out all 33 of ours over the weekend. Please let us know what you think of them. Do get in touch via social media the chat function in Zoom, or drop us an email on info at chimerafestival.co.uk. We'd love to hear from you. We hope you have a fantastic weekend, and we look forward to seeing you in person next year for Chimera 2021. Well, hello everybody, and good evening. Thank you very much for joining us here at the second Chimera Festival of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Literature. My name's Joe Gordon, I'm a bookseller and a reviewer. This evening, I am joined by three writers, Maura McHugh, Joseph Elliott Coleman, and Michael Owen Carroll, to discuss oh. their tales of the Judges series, mm. which is set in the early days of the law system that we're familiar with from the pages of the mighty 2008 comic. We will be taking questions directly from yourselves towards the end of the chat, just as we would if it was a, a live show in the Pleasance. Mm -hmm. There is a Q&A button, which you should be able to find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can use that to send us some questions, and we'll try and get to those towards the end of the hour. Now, oh, let's introduce our people. Michael Owen Carroll is a citizen of Murphyville on the Emerald Isle. He has been heavily involved in the Irish SF scene for many years, notably with Octagon, which is a gathering I am sure more than a few of our audience are familiar with, and has been a writer for more years than he probably wants me to mention. Yep. <laughs> Mike has a very impressive roster of works, from short stories to novellas to young adult books, including his popular New Hero series, to adult novels and, of course, a very large body of work for the galaxy's greatest comic. From Future Shocks, the short stories with a twist that have long been an avenue into writing for 2000 AD, right up to a huge swathe of work set in the world of Judge Dredd. Joseph Elliott Bowman is from the People's Republic of Croydon and Brits it. He has been penning stories since he was a boy and Beautiful. was especially involved with some friends who came out of the early online forums in the 90s who used to encourage each other in meetups to do writing. Bloody hell, you've done your research, haven't you? I have done my research. I had to dig around for it. Joseph was one of the contributors to the Not So Stories, a modern collection where writers of colour from around the world took Kipling's stories, cherishing the fantastic elements that made them so popular, but reimagining them away from their colonialist, imperialist, and racist view of the world. His entry into the universe of dread with the story Patriots is remarkably powerful and disturbingly, quite frighteningly close to some of the shocking scenes that we've been seeing on the news from the States recently. And yes, We'll be talking about that. <laughs> Maura McHugh was born amongst the mega cities, but thankfully was raised on the Emerald Isle. I first encountered Maura's writing with the Eagle Award nominated indie Irish comic Jennifer Wilde, illustrated by Stephen Downey, and her writing resume is extremely impressive, from a slew of short stories to collections to comic works and scripts for radio, film, and stage work, including The Nightborn Sisters, part of the Halloween sessions with other writers like Kim Newman and that was performed at the Leicester Square Theatre. And she's even scripted a computer game based on Jennifer Wilde, which leads me to think, Maura, is there any medium you haven't actually written for yet? Um, actually, I had a bit of a bingo card on that one. <laughs> um, I have pretty much knocked off all the bingo squares. I have a feeling there's one I'm missing, um, but yes, I just like to write widely and I find working in different media um, mm -hmm. allows me to strengthen different um, different parts of my writing. That's why it's very useful. 
Brilliant. Well, anyway, all three of you, welcome to our virtual Chimera. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rather than doing a, a reading, since there's three of you here, what we're going to do tonight is um, Mike uh, is going to ask if you could maybe introduce the concept behind the judges series for the people who some of the audience won't have read them yet. If you could just tell us before we get into the individual stories that you've written, just what the actual idea behind the series is, what the setup okay. is. Yeah, um, Judge Dredd was invented back in 1977 by John Magner and Carlos Esquerra with input from Pat Mills and later with a lot of input from Alan Grant. Um, and Dredd's written stories were set in 2099 and it's moved on a year every year. So it actually ages in real time. But what we've done with the Judges series, and this is where I move to my, my uh, props. <laughs> oh, we have... Um, props, this the, is good. Oh, yeah. We have the Judges series here, and we, what we've done is we've gone back to the very early days of the Judges, um, mm -hmm. which have been touched on a lot uh, over the years by Don Wagner and co. And um, our first book, this volume, uh, came out there a couple of years ago. We have, I don't have the second volume yet, a physical copy, but uh, Joseph and Maura have written these two. Uh, excellent, excellent books. Um, and I, I, I've written a little piece to introduce the whole thing, if you'd like me to, to read that out. Um, that, would be, that would be excellent, yes, please. Okay, so, I will do it in my best mumbly voice where I spit over the words and get things wrong. If that's okay with everybody? Excellent. Oh, yes. Thank you. I'm very good at that. So, United States of America, 2033 AD. Growing social and political upheavals are tearing the country apart, and things have reached the point where the only feasible solution seems to lie with Special Prosecutor Eustace Fargo's controversial new Department of Justice. In Fargo's words, this country's problems can't be fixed by photo opportunities and easy to remember slogans. This is going to be something different, something new. I intend to create an elite police force, hand-picked, highly trained, highly educated, and very carefully vetted. They will be the best of the best. They'll know the law inside out and will be absolutely unassailable and unimpeachable. The change is always met with resistance. When the first judges, judges hit the streets, the streets hit back hard. But Fargo's vision is strong and the judges are relentless in their pursuit of justice. There are no appeals, no second chances. You break the law, they will break you. For the first time since the United States was formed, crime may have met its match. But many are convinced that this new cure is far worse than the disease. Mm -hmm. In a state where individual officers have the power to dispense instant justice and instant punishment, there's very little room left for liberty. For that. Thank you. <laughs> so that's, that's where we begin. Sorry. And um, the idea is that we say we start off in the 2030s and now Dredd's original series was 2099, his first episode. But, what, but by that, they established quite quickly he'd been on the streets for 20 years. So many, many years ago, Rebellion produced a series of novellas called Judge Dredd Year One and Year Two. Oh, by an amazing coincidence, <laughs> I have the Year One and Year Two. So what we've done, where's your... Yeah, so what we've done is we decided with the Judges series to start in the 2030s, and we're writing three, we wrote three novellas. I wrote one, and uh, there's two more, and then we went to the 2040s, and that's where Maura and Joseph came in. Next mm -hmm. one off the 2050s, 2060s, and then we'll catch up with the 2070s. Ah, oh, um, so you're going to work right through up until yeah, that's the, the, plan. the present, the present, almost the present day of the. And then what we'll do is the dread at, stories. At, yeah, and at some point then, what we want to do, depending on how everybody's <laughs> schedules work out, is <clears throat> come back to the uh, the writers like Joseph and Mora and say, okay, where do your characters go from here? Mm. Ready um, and waiting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I want more than enough material to work with, now, Mother of God. Oh, well, we see, we, you, you've, you've both read incredibly strong characters that, that we're going, ah, no, they weren't meant to be this good because <laughs> we, we need to move on. Um, so we, have, we don't have to come back that because some of the stuff that you've set up is, is fantastic. Um, the, the way that we all, we know where we're going. We know how this is going to end up. It's going to make City One with the judges in power. But our job here, creating these stories, is to, to show the little highlights along the way. Um, so we don't necessarily know the route by which we get there. Yeah. Uh, and of course, I suppose arguably we didn't even know where we started from because 2000 started in 1977 when the idea was that, oh, you know, Europe would be invaded by the Volgans and then Mega City yeah. would, would form and so on. And that's all gone. Now we're building this on America as it is today. And that's particularly noticeable in, in, in Joe's book, um, Joseph's book, because what we've seen in the past few months, the past few weeks in particular, has been mm. 
terrifying. It's almost like they're following his script. So um, it's, it, yeah, we, in, in a way we're kind of, we're not trying to say we're predicting um, the way America's going to go. We're kind of predicting the way we don't want it to go, mm-hmm. but it just might. Yeah. That's enough for me. Yeah. Well, science fiction by its very nature is uh, prophetic, isn't it? So yeah, it's, yes, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Frighten me so frequently. Oh, yeah. I, it was, I mean, honestly, it was quite terrifying reading particularly all three stories, but particularly Joseph's, um, mm-hmm. which was the last one in the collection when I was reading it. So it was the third one that I came to. And things were just starting to kick off in the States while I was reading that one. And it was just, I'd be sitting there reading it. I'd go out for the, the daily government sanctioned walk somewhere to read it for a little while. And you'd read a bit of it and then have to stop because it was so close to what was happening. You just have to sit there for a few minutes and go, okay, hold on a minute, take a breath. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you were aiming at targets in societal problems when you were writing it, but you couldn't have realized what was going to actually happen. And just well, I kind of saw that, that would actually become. Well, here's the thing. I saw the writing was on the wall, and I saw that if you look back at history, specifically um, um, things such as, uh, you know, I, I quote the Bader Meinhof uh, group. And um, also, I don't know whether I also uh, referenced uh, the years of lead between the 1960s and the 1980s, but there have always been there was a lots of things that were happening in the mid to late uh, 20th century that have been echoed throughout uh, the modern era. So I knew it was only a matter of time before something like that occurred in the U.S. So. Yeah, you know, and with the uh, everything that Trump was doing in the in the, uh, the United States, you know, he was basically emboldening uh, the far right. I could li- see that there would be a certain point where things would kick off, and it it I'm not not surprised. I'm disappointed that nobody could have pulled the brakes and say, "Whoa, stop!" <laughs> you know, it seems like we've gone over. The mountain are now falling into the the crevice, and there's nothing to there's nothing at the bottom to uh, to catch our fall. Yeah, I find it kind of funny as well because there's one of the things I really enjoyed about all three stories is running through them. It's not a black and white morality in there. There's a good clashing of moralities. You can see arguments on both sides. There are people, not necessarily always for the the best reasons. Sometimes it's the you know the patriot ones who are doing the you're fighting for liberty, but they're quite happy to kill everybody for liberty. They obviously would really care. Mm. Or you have people at Officer Kwan and Light's story who's determined to try and uphold traditional justice and doesn't like the, the judges system. It's too fascist for her. Mm-hmm. And you see their point, but then you also see the point of view from the judges going, yeah, but our system isn't working. You bring us in, we don't care what color you are, what gender you are, we don't care how rich you are. We will judge you purely on the crime. We will be impartial. And that's it. And you're thinking, that's scary to have that much power. But at the same time, you can also see an argument for it. At the same time, you can see one going, nobody should have that amount of power. And Mm -hmm. I thought that was really good. I mean, I'm assuming that all three of you had a ball using those moral clashes because that's that's got to be a lot of meat and drink for your uh, your, Mm -hmm. for the drama in your in your story. How much fun did you have playing with the, the moral quandaries? Well, the, the, my characters are in side division or the start of what's known as side division within the judges. And they're um, people with psionic powers. And it's, in the Judge Dredd universe in the comic, they're often referred to as mutants. And so within the judges system, they're actually not viewed. They're always viewed slightly with suspicion. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I w- I've been interested in with Side Division, because I've written Anderson for the comic as well, is the fact that there's no choice involved. So it's people who are othered within the judges system and they themselves are being co-opted violently, uh, as in they're being literally taken from their homes, raised within the system to support the system. and. Uh, And there's a real interesting problem there for people who are working within a fascist, and it is a fascist system, a totalitarian fascist system, but then they themselves are in this limbo state of being weird, you know, like I say, kind of othered within the system. And because they have abilities, they can actually have a very strong empathy with what's happening to the citizens. So that's, 
that's a very interesting dynamic for me and that's what I was looking at a lot um, and these are often people because of their abilities so within the judges series which is pre 2000 AD megacity um, they themselves are marginalized because of these abilities which they have hidden and weirdly <clears throat> the new division gives them a place to use their abilities safely. Yeah. It's a very complicated power dynamic. And um, I was quite very interested in that. Well, as you say, the side division people, even in the dread era where it's a proper division, they are always the outsiders. They're up there with the Wally squad as one that the other judges look at as you're necessary, but we don't really like you. And of course, the other judges have spent, they've spent their life shutting themselves off. The side judges can't help but, but feel yeah. what's going on. I mean, it's part of their, their actual gift and their nature. It, it kind of reminds me a bit as well what you were saying there, but um, Straczynski in Babylon 5 had some similar elements when he had the, uh, the, the telepaths in Babylon 5. And I think one of the, uh, yeah. I, think, I think Commander Ivanova's mother, was she, she was actually had been a telepath and she had the choice of you either join the Corps or you have to take the meds that yes. shut down your... Uh, your abilities, but also zombify you. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, that's it's basically press ganging people, isn't it? It's, mm. it's not a great, it's not a great choice. <laughs> it's not a great choice. Um, I want to say, is it the outsider bit that, that, that draws you in? Because I mean, you have, you have been dabbling in side division and getting to do something in the early days when they're even more unusual and out there than they are in Dreads era. How much yeah, did that I appeal? Mean, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 um... It's interesting to, I mean, uh, Mike and I talked about it a little bit um, and when we were, when I was coming up with the, with the idea and this idea of them running as a kind of a black ops within the system yeah. for several decades because it was too outlandish. <laughs> People with powers is too outlandish for when the judges system is trying to set itself up. Yeah. So they're kind of operating in stealth mode um, but also, um, there's a kind of um, thing I'm looking at as well about um, other powers trying to influence the system yeah. and seeing the judges' uh, system as really problematic and a um, potentially, like if you were another country, having such a, a solid judges' system would be a threat for many people. Yeah, I'm actually seeing there's a nice one coming up here in our chat window from Gary, who's just making a nice point that uh, in, in Dread, the side judges are the only, the, 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 uh, they're the ones that don't have their names on the badge. Everyone else does, which is ah, that's true. Just, just one of those nice things. Yeah, I've always thought about that. So why, why don't they have their name on there? And it is oh, just, just that, like, they're different to everyone else. <laughs> that's right. Unless, of course, they all change their first name or their second name to Judge Sai. Which is exactly how I would do it. Um, I've always wondered what happens if you're a judge and you have a very, very long surname, though. I mean, how do you fit that are, into the badge? If you're a poo from The Simpsons and your name is Nahasa Peter Petalon, then you know, your badge goes like way out, way beyond the scope of this camera. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, um, Turn to your story for a minute, Golgotha. So, uh, with Golgotha, I was. Uh, it's very close to our own era. It's yeah. basically you know, the five minutes into the future kind of thing. It's very much it's a world we all yeah. recognize ourselves. This is all pre the atomic wars and the mega cities. It's still America. Yeah. And I found it really interesting seeing judges, but they're rolling into like small towns in Wisconsin or whatever, and you know, going up to a biker bar and opening the door and walking in and everybody goes quiet. And you just, this is so different from the normal Judge Dread world. Yeah. Was it quite good fun being able to take those kind of characters, but put them into a world that's essentially ours it's not it's not 200 years in the future it's pretty much well, our yeah, i think that's where we we all had um there's a fun with with that to to basically to 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 take what starts off as our world to some degree yeah. and, and, and when we're there but with um you know, with with Golgotha, i deliberately chose a um a small town because of the impact and uh, it was only when I was halfway through writing so i realized so i'd done the exact same thing with my first one in the series the avalanche but um we, with with Golgotha, I chose a town in the south in Alabama, where they're traditionally, according to literature anyway, not the most welcoming of change. Um, and then I deliberately didn't address that because I just wanted us to to have individual people uh, reacting to it. Um, the judges become the um, 
they become the new enemy for all of the people, even yeah. the cops. Um, the, the, the premise of Golgotha is that the, the, police, the police forces are being phased out and the main character um, is the last, uh, the last cop basically to, to graduate in the United States of yeah. America. And she's, I mean, she's, she's young, she's naive, she's, she's really very, um, very gullible enough, not gullible, naive, I guess, probably the best word. Um, she believes there's, there's right and there's wrong, and she is absolutely wrong. But if she's, she's in the same way as the judges are, but she, she knows that the judges are wrong, but she has to work with them. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so she, basically, she's doing the thing of, a very literature show of working with the enemy. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a case of uh, you can show, if you, if you use a small town in fiction, you can show the world a microcosm to a degree. You yeah. can't really do that in a big city to the same way. Uh, plus, we, we've all, we're all used to seeing futuristic big cities, the dystopian yeah. future, the soil and greens and the Blade Runners and all that sort of stuff. I think it's much more interesting to go to a small town where you, you pretty much do at least recognize everybody, even if you don't know them. And then you introduce a new element like the judges yeah. or some dangerous new drug like um, actually jo Joseph did. And um, that changes everything because it's, it's a huge, huge um, and powerful catalyst, if, if not an actual reaction, um, to, 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 to stir everything up. And when you stir things up, mostly what rises to the surface is the dirt. And that's <laughs> what you want in the story. <laughs> that was really good, wasn't it? It but, was. <laughs> Joseph, you, 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 uh, you, you had them right in the Big Apple at one point, mm. rather than Small Town mm. in, in Patriots. And uh, I find it really interesting. There was a, for me anyway, there was a kind of uh, an almost a 1970s vibe back when New York, you know, when New York was really bad for crime and litter and, you know, the, the taxi driver era, that sort of thing. I was it's getting a bit of that. Uh, a, and I could be wrong, but I was also thinking in certain bits where you uh, are you giving a wee nod there to John Carpenter's Assault on Precinct 13 at one point as well. Put it this way, uh, that, uh, the French Connection, yeah. a whole host of uh, crime novels and films. I kind of got a Manchurian candidate vibe in there as well. Oh, at one yeah, point. definitely, definitely. <laughs> I think you've watched a lot of 70s films, actually, Joe. I'm a huge cineast, so yes, I've watched a very... Good, I, I approve, I approve. Yeah. Yeah, so I used that as my starting point and basically moved it so many decades into the future and started yeah. to build my story on top of that. Uh, one of the biggest influences, I think, I think two of the biggest, three, no, three of the biggest influences were probably uh, The Wire, which I would assume, have any of you? Have, yeah. Okay, we'll see. I'm still the not Wire, Sorry. Um, yeah. uh, Alfred Bester's The Demolished Man, and mm. uh, John Brunner's uh, Stand on Zanzibar. Zanzibar. Yes. Um, I have a copy over there. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And I basically, they were the fuel that basically uh, motivated the story. So, yeah, 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 that's basically where I got the idea from. For the full album, obviously, I had a chance to read it because the book's quite recent. It's only been out for a very short time. Do you mm -hmm. want to tell them a little bit about what your story entails? Okay, uh, essentially, the story is about. It's a very political story. Well, obviously, it's a political story. Uh, it's, it's a story about that's not only inspired by the events that are currently occurring in the US, but also the idea of um, educated and radicalized youth who believe that only violence can affect change. Uh, one of the major uh, spurs of the story is, uh, as I previously mentioned, the book, uh, the, the, by the Meinhof book by uh, Stefan, uh, uh, Stefan Aust, uh, that basically chronicles the rise and the fall of the uh, Red Army store. Uh, Red Army, is it Red Army? What's it called again? Oh, good God. Faction? That faction, yeah. Red yeah. Army faction. That, it's almost uh, confusing because it would always be, say, RAF, which confused the hell out of me because that means something else. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I, I think that was done deliberately. Um, and um, it basically asked the question, well, it doesn't really ask the question, if there is... A, there's a right to be in a rise in fascism and people are unwilling to attack it. What would a group or a population need to do in order to wake people up, to force them to take this, uh, uh, this thing on? I mean, you saw, I don't know if any of you are aware of what happened in Algeria in the 1970s and 80s. There was a, uh, a radical Islamic group 
who were of the opinion that the only way that you could force the population to uh, attack the uh, neo-colonial influences that were at work in the country was to terrorize them with extreme violence until such point as the people rose up and decided, okay, we've had enough, you need to leave, and we need to capitulate the, the demands of these people. And if memory said what happened was the opposite. The, uh, the people actually picked up guns and tried to force these terrorists out. Um, going back to your question, essentially what I wanted to ask myself is, <clears throat> I think the best kind of science fiction isn't the one that gives answers, the ones that uh, ask questions and leaves the answers to the reader. Mm. So in the writing of my story, I wanted to walk a very, very thin line between, okay, what these people are doing is reprehensible, but they're coming from a place of, how can I say it? Their, not so much their goals are just not, yeah, their goals are justifiable, the means are uh, abhorrent. Mm. The same token, the judges, you know, the, uh, uh, the removal of uh, small rights and uh, privileges in order to give people security, we know from history that that is a slippery slope to totalitarianism. But if, the, if, a, if a society is so corrupt and the laws are so broken that it necessitates uh, an division such as the judges to arise, is that the fault of the institution or is it a fault of the society? So yeah. I, I basically wanted to ask hard questions and, and based off a lot of the reviews that I've read, uh, people have either been... Uh, they don't like the questions that they were answered or they were appreciative that the questions were asked. Yeah. Because well, I, must admit, I think a lot I, of, I, uh, a I lot of them one really of the, don't the, like I the get, answers. Sorry. So, so go ahead. No, no, when you go, please, please No, I said a lot of the people don't like, I found that a lot of the people, more than a few people don't like the answers that uh, they've come up mm. with. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the point must, of the story. You know, I must admit one of the things I, kept thinking of when I was reading that one was one of my all-time favorite Judge Dreads, which is the America story. John Funny Wagner enough, that was another inspiration. The, the beautiful yes. artwork by Colin McNeil, and that, again, was very morally complex because on the one hand, normally you'd be rooting for the person who's fighting for freedom and liberty, but they don't care who gets hurt in the, the way, and you're going, well, you, you're not really fighting for the people if you don't care if the people get killed in the way, exactly. are you? But at the same time, dread cracking down, you go, oh, you're crushing down my God, who do I root for here? Where, where is it? There was bits, and it, again, offended in all three of your books, all three of your stories, that there was that bit of, you're not always entirely certain who to root for. You, as you were saying, some of the organizers and the Patriots, they commit evil acts, but there is, at least at the start, maybe, a kind mm -hmm. of noble purpose to it. Yes. I mean, they see themselves as kind of the heirs to the, the founding fathers and the spirit of civil yes, yes, and all yes. that sort of thing. But it's also quite clear that they don't care, that they're going to use people unwillingly. It's not even, I mean, you're going, well, if you're for liberty, why aren't you letting the people make the choice? And they're going, no, we're going to use a Manchurian candidate style and make them do this it's for their own good. And you're going, well, that makes you pretty similar to the judges then. This is for your own exactly. good to change your medicine. Exactly. But, oh, yes, it does, it, it, it makes it, as you say, it does not give you an answer, but my God, it makes you think, which is really yes. good in any group. Which is what I, I think that's the best, the best fiction does that. I mean, I, I myself have very little interest in entertainment. What I really want to do with my work is force people to think and feel things. If you sit down with one of my works and you're just entertained, then I've failed. Oh, well, you that, did actually. Oh, uh, that's not right. Hang on, a, I will take issue with you on that, sir. Oh, fair I enough. Think, um, I know. I, I I do understand what you're saying, and I I I, I agree. But if the reader takes what they want or what they can out of all the stories. So it's very important that, to my mind anyway, that fiction is entertaining first. Of course. Um, of course. But in we've all read the books where they just, the political message is hammered home with a, a, a sledgehammer and a spike. We, I've always said that politics and so on should, should, uh, shouldn't come crashing in through the windows and should seep up through the floorboards and through the crack of the door. Is that mm -hmm. you, the reader takes it in without noticing, I think. But, I mean, yeah, Joseph's point is absolutely right. You, th that we do need to make the readers think, but we don't need to tell them 
Dr. Yes, I agree yeah. completely. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> let me, let me I, perhaps I misspoke. I mean, I don't, I am not interested in just entertaining the reader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, but, but entertaining them, the entertainment is the it's the medium through which the message is delivered. Or should yes. Um, well, actually, I, I'm going to skip back a little bit. In there, our first trilogy of of, um, of books, we had. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, hang on, they're behind me here. Uh, ba, ba. The first trilogy we had, one by me, but we also had uh, Lone Wolf by George Mann. I think mm. I'm not very good at holding this up to the camera. Um, which has, has a fantastic premise that I'm, I'm, I wish we'd mentioned, mentioned earlier. Um, it's, it's where the judges. Um, doing their job, they find uh, they find a bad guy, he's a serial killer, they execute him. And then they find out that there's potentially another victim who has who might still be alive but mm. can't be found because their instant justice has dispensed with the killer. But the killer's problems still linger and I think that's very indicative of the way it goes. And then the follow-up book then by Charles J. Eskew, mm. which is one of my favourite covers. Wow, that's gorgeous, isn't it? Um, well, like I still, he deals with a lot of the same sort of problems. Is that basically we have a situation where people have come up with a political solution to a to a potential social, a potentially dangerous social problem. Mm -hmm. Politics and society are not always going to mesh perfectly, and that's the the oh. greater grind against each other, and that's where we get our our conflict, and that's where we get our fiction. And mm -hmm. I think that that I mean that actually shows up in Morris as well because Morris cheated by doing two stories at the same time, by telling a story set in the future in Dread's time as well as mm -hmm. in the present. So um, I, I must well, I have to say, as the sort of series editor of this, I'm very pleased with the stories that come out so far. So <laughs> well done, guys. Mora, that actually reminds me. For, um, sorry, we we didn't actually get you to uh, tell us a bit more about your story and also what, you know how it unfolds. And also, I was really impressed with the, the twin timeline narrative that you did, and I was wondering how. Okay. Why you approached it that way, but also how difficult it was as a writer to actually, because that's it's not oh, a good thing to do. <laughs> um, the, so yeah, that story is about the setting up of Sidiv, um, or its genesis, which yeah. starts in a, like a covert operation and to the point where they're not even allowed, like, uh, complete deniability that it exists. Um, and it is set up like Fargo allows it to be set up but uh, they have to operate in their own way and uh, this is so the the story is about the very first sort of test run of these um, psi operatives and at the same time there's two the main character we're following is there's there's so there's three psi judges at this time um, and the lead or the one we're following mostly is Phoebe Wise but at the same time it actually starts in present day uh, 2000 AD uh, with a, a precog judge called um, Pam Reed. So it's actually the two of them have some quantum entanglement going on so we're actually seeing two, two things at the same time and they themselves support each other and there is an implication that if this did not happen uh, 2000 AD would have gone in a vastly different area of yeah. way um, uh, and that's sort of why there's I have lots of background reasons why it happened and I don't go into it it just happens in the book but I actually know why it happens so um, uh, yeah and so that's that's what's going on and it was really um, I decided from the get-go that I was going to challenge myself and about a quarter of the way in I was like, do not, why did you challenge yourself? <laughs> this is so hard. You created a rod for your own back. Oh dear. <laughs> I know, I should have just, I was like, why did you do this? You know, <laughs> so anyway, but it was good and I enjoyed writing it and um, you really push yourself. And of course, the other thing is, I have to say, um, like with comics, but even with publishing, like you get so much help from your editor, um, mm -hmm. Mike, uh, David Brooks. Yes, huge amount of support. Um, the Indeed. art department, the um, marketing. I mean, it's really, uh, I'm constantly aware, and I, often, I try to emphasize this a lot when I'm talking about projects, is like you really are part of a team and you're so, in, it's so important 
all that work that you get from other people. And Mike's knowledge of 2000 AD is incredible. Like, you, it's so good to be able to go to him and ask him questions. I, I, I don't know anybody, I just make it all up. Um, <laughs> you don't know, you're not going to check. <laughs> But you know, there are, because there are some people that are always going to yank you up on little details. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. Anoraks. They're always Anoraks. <laughs> well, that's, that's why every story should have a tiny element of time travel in there somewhere, because that way, if you make a mistake, you can always go, no, 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 the timeline was altered. Yeah, did you? <laughs> <laughs> it's Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah, you get away with everything. That's your get a free card, basically. So. Yeah, yeah. What was interesting more when you, what you were talking about there leads me to something else I was thinking about um, when I was reading them. All three of your stories work very well in and of themselves, but they also felt very connected. And I was wondering how much chat there was between you when you were making them, because obviously you're working in this, it's a shared universe. So you're writing your own story, but you're going to have certain constraints. I was wondering how much you guys chatted when you were actually doing the writing, because they do feel they fit very well together and they flow very well together and they feel very connected into that dread continuity. So I was wondering how much freedom you had to move within that and how much, you know, there were certain lines that you had to stay within. Well, you have to pitch your idea, you know. Right. So then um, the various editors get to say, oh, yeah, that's good. And I assume then if they don't like what you're suggesting, but actually, to be honest, I had great support and um and Michael and I do happen to know each other a long time. So mm. uh, I was able to, but actually I tend to want to just work on it in my own head and get the draft out. But I did touch base a lot with Mike uh, on certain specific information. Um, yeah, but no, I mean, to, Rebellion has been, it's, it's a bit boring to say they've been great you know, and it's the same with the comics too, actually. Mm. Yeah, That's good to know. How was your experience, Joseph? In my case, um, I've, I, I, memory serves, I think my story was completed last. Uh, I think it was one of the last stories to uh, actually be submitted for the, um, uh, for the collection. I had the benefit of that all of the stories were written. So uh, when I was working with my heir uh, with uh, David's, uh, David Moore, who was, uh, the, helping with uh, with uh, the editing of the work he was basically able to say okay you've written this thing this contradicts something that's happened in or one of the other stories this also contradicts something that's happening uh, over here so you need to change this change that so it wasn't it was a case of slight rewriting and a little bit of editing that uh, that was uh, that was necessary but it's, I felt as if I was a Joey in a kangaroo's womb, in a sense that, <laughs> no, seriously, I did. I really oh, felt no, as if great. I was, I felt <laughs> safe. I felt warm. I felt protected. I thought, oh my God, I'm, this is so much fun. <laughs> you know, I, it, it's, it, it was, it was a wonderful experience. Um, uh, the first draft that I handed in uh, got pretty harsh but extremely constructive feedback and every single every other draft that I received off the bat I got less and less and less feedback to the point where uh, David turned around and said yeah the growth between the first and the last draft you handed in is gargantuan I saw as if it was written by two different people so yeah. okay where is this other Joseph Elliott Coleman and what, what where can I meet him but it was a wonderful experience I, and uh, Echo was a uh, 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 Moira, Moira says, yes, I did and do still feel that I'm working as part of the team and it's a wonderful experience. I really, really, really do hope I get the opportunity to do it again. You know? would, you, would you consider You're doing some of the comics as well, Joseph? Or... I've, uh, well, I have, well, before the lockdown, I was actually, uh, actually written a future shot that I was going to submit for yep. the open draft. Um, yes, I certainly would. It, if the opportunity arises, I would definitely want to work with Rebellion again on something or anything. One of the things that um, I think they should do in the face of the current political climate is that they really should start Crisis again. I don't know if anybody's mm. aware, Crisis, that was a um, political comic book that uh, Fleetway, the original publishers, one of the original publishers of 2008, published in the... Uh, late 80s early 90s yep. and they had some 
really brilliant, brilliant stories. Uh, Third World War by uh, Pat Mills and Carlos Esquera. Um, uh, lots of other stories like that. They were absolutely fantastic. I really think there should be more material out there like that than 2000 East sitting on a gold mine. I mean, you've got some of the most creative and talented writers and artists living in the UK that would be more than willing to contribute to a, 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 a new version of this, uh, this anthology. So I think they should seize the zeitgeist, so for a better use of the term. Yeah. I can see crisis, good. not not just repeating, but a new crisis one would be quite yes, interesting. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, definitely, definitely. But only yes. if it's got stories by us in it. It's what not worth mean? anything if we're not writing in it, yeah? Both about it. Mike, Mike, you're the series editor. How did you find working with yourself on this then? Were you terrible to yourself going, no, you can write better than this, oh, Michael? Yeah, well, I am my, my own worst enemy anyway, but... Uh, you know, what happened with this was the way it came about. I pitched the idea many, many, many years ago. I think of of doing something like this. Because when I was writing, imagine before I started writing Judge Dredd Year One. But um, there's there's always with, with a publisher like Rebellion, they they have so many different things happening. They've got uh, Abaddon and Solaris and the, their own mm. books and the comics and everything. The Treasury of British Comics, all this fantastic stuff. So there's stuff out there floating around all the time, and every now and again, one of them lands, and you go, "Oh yeah, I remember that." And then you go, "Wait, actually, I." <laughs> Pitch that idea. So, yeah, so uh, David Thomas Moore, who's the um, the head honcho, as far as I'm concerned. Um, with regard to Absolute the, mentor guy. Oh, he's a brilliant guy. He, he, yeah. he basically said to me, we, we're, we're going to do this dredges thing. How do you want to do it? And I said, I want to go through each decade. But one of the key things is that because we know it's going to end up in, in Dred's world, mm. we don't, we're not telling the, the really big stories as such. We don't necessarily want to to uh, have every story about something that's going to change the world. Every, mm. the, the bad guy who's got a bomb that can blow up the sun or whatever. <laughs> uh, the story should be about individual people and have the politics happening in the background. So you'd hear the, you know, the, the hall of justice falling down or whatever, but you wouldn't necessarily see it. Um, and that way we're telling stories that are on the ground and not necessarily so sort of soaring through the air. And that's why Particularly, I wanted to work with 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 more, and I've known more since uh, since we were both little girls playing in the schoolyard, and <laughs> more was well, I've known more. It's right. Yeah, I've read more of her books and or more of her stories than anybody else. Um, and so I, I knew she could do it. Joseph, I didn't know until hang on, I've even got a copy over there. I got a copy of Not So Stories. I'm not going to go and get it. Um, <laughs> David gave me this and said, "Read that. What do you think?" And I went, "Okay, we want this guy." Um, and you weren't the only one, but you were high on the list. <laughs> and I needed people who oh. um, understood, I needed writers who understood the people. Um, I thought we had Charles Eskew for the, um, for when you were, the late, 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 I mean, this, this was the most controversial of the books we've, we've had so far, but, and it's, it's not an easy read compared to, say, the mine or, or George Mann's, but this is one where, if anybody who hasn't read it yet, this is worth, worth a look. It's, this pays off at the end. Um, so we've got th four, to, well, four very different writers and me um, so far. And the next mm. phase is we've just signed someone, I can't say who, for the next phase uh, for the 2050s. But from this point on, we have to be, I have to be much more strict with the stories uh, because I've been allowing the writers to, to, to tell their tale in, you know, in a kind of a vague time frame that exists in the early days of the judges. But yeah. we, as time goes, we get closer to Dred's time, we do know more of what's supposed to have happened at specific yeah. points. So yeah, you've got an actual history there that it has to, exactly, you can't yes. contradict that, it's a shared universe. So. Yeah, we have to be very and and you just know, particularly sci-fi fans, if somebody does contradict it, there will be a million of us on Twitter going, oh, I think you'll find that in 2229, <laughs> actually, and, I, and that I, will happen. And it will happen because we're sci-fi fans. We do that. To that's we like doing that. We love nitpicking. We love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, so from now on, it gets, it gets much more complicated from my point of view, but hopefully the, the writers will mm. find the same joy that I hope um, our, our two friends here have, that they've enjoyed their story, even though we've had restrictions and we've had we've been kind of hard yes to kind of through this. yes yeah. more um, than a few yeah but there's a whole oh god sorry go. as you say we, we only learn as writers by you can only get to greater heights by climbing obstacles you mm -hmm. know so it's my job is to make things as hard as possible for the other writers and in <laughs> fact the next book has to be written without the letter e 
and uh, <laughs> and no spaces because spaces are a privilege that they must earn. But uh, yeah, so what I as I say, what I want to do is at some point then I do want to come back because I want to revisit the characters that mm. I just, or have set up and and the ones that George Mann and and Charles Askew set up in their books and indeed some of mine. But that's that's well, that's of my brief at the moment. But it mm. we've created things that are too good not to revisit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It'd be, it would be good to see these characters a bit further down and not just be one-off. Yeah, I have no well. problem being like a Ed McBain and basically coming up to my bedroom, at uh, coming up to my writing room and I'm at, uh, what, on a Friday morning and coming down uh, Sunday night with a new Dredgers uh, Dredgers <laughs> novella. <laughs> Seriously. You know, just populating my small corner of the Dredverse with thousands and thousands of characters. I can do that. Well, That's you, see, you don't have to exist solely in the one corner, you know. There's a lot mm. of places to explore. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I would really like to do something in the UK. You know, the, what would the effect of uh, uh, the rise of the judges be like in the UK or, or in Africa even? You know, well, this is the thing. I mean, in 2008, we see judge systems all around the world, and you wonder, well, I wonder how they, they came hey. into being. I mean, every every country at some point, in the in the era of dread, has this system, yes. to some extent or another. Yes. You know, even, even Emerald Isles got theirs, albeit they still have judges that will go into the pint, you know, go for a pint of Guinness after work, which is, <laughs> it's just wonderfully Irish. Thank you, Garth Ennis. Uh, <laughs> yes. I think we're Mike did a bit yeah. more work on that. <laughs> we're, that yeah. we're getting up to, it's, uh, we've got about 15 minutes to go, so we should probably start maybe taking some questions from the audience. Guys, cool. I've got a couple here on the uh, Q&A screen already. If any of the rest of you are thinking of anything, shove it on there and we'll see if we can get to it. But uh, I've got one here. It's quite a good one, actually. He's picking up on something that Joseph was talking about there. James is interested in what sort of story would Joseph write for a new version of Crisis? And what would Maura and Mike write if they were doing for it? Ooh. I would go for the lion's throat. I would do something set in the US. Uh, it would be very pointed. It would be about race and relations, the history of... Uh, 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 the, uh, the American history with racism and the institutions that perpetuate it, it's to be very, very pointed and uh, probably get bombs sent to my house. <laughs> well, we don't really want that one. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. Well, well, yeah, it would be, uh, I, I, I think there's no point in beating around the bush. Near the, the beauty of comics is that they have a supernatural ability to the combination of words and letters that are the words and pictures they have an ability to be universally translatable and this more so than literature and uh, it, film even uh, it's, you have a a, 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 a a an image that is immediately relatable to by anybody that can read it so I think to myself that uh, once you have this 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 gift of a, of a of a medium, you might you have responsibility to utilize it to its full extent. What well, about the rest of you? Would you be interested in doing a version, new version of Crisis? And if so, what would you do? More? Yeah. Oh well, actually, I'm not as familiar with Crisis. Uh, it's a slight gap of mine. It was, it was a comic for boys, Maura, that's why. It was mm. really... <laughs> so in that, that, that being the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I... Oops. One of the things I think about a lot uh, in relation to 2000 AD and everything is, you know, it's this idea of who makes the rules. Like, um, so... One of the things about 2000 AD is that Judge Fargo decides I'm going to solve everything and I'm going to make the rules. So I always think, you know, who makes the rules, you know, who's in power, who's got power, and what are they supporting? Um, Who watches the watchman? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, in in the instance of, say, what's going on in the US is, the idea that we must protect the buildings from being burned. Now, don't get me wrong, because that's a complicated issue there. But more important is you can't rebuild a life. If someone is dead, they're dead. They don't come back. You know, you can rebuild a building mm. and uh, you can potentially 
uh, work with the community. So, I mean, I think we have a really um, uh, problematic relationship with value. What do we value? Do we value physical buildings and statues or do we value people? And the thing I always think about is within each person, there is an entire universe. Every yes. time you kill a person, you destroy a universe. And I think so much of stuff tries to do the wide focus and say, and, and it's almost as if it's irrelevant that like 20 people have died or it's like only 20 people have died. I it's mean, just a number. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, with the pandemic, the thing that's really hard to wrap your head around is how many people are now dead in this, in the world, in the space of three months. You know, uh, it's, it's uh, so, and I think in my mind, that's, uh, you know, how many thousands of universes destroyed because, and a lot of them, not all, but a lot of them were preventable. But people in power didn't think those people, and it's always those people, were important enough to be protected. So anyway, that's my... <laughs> um, <laughs> I always remember, when you think about things of that nature, where, about the pandemic or about any, any case where there's a, a huge loss of life and people start feeling it as numbers, I always remember Terry Pratchett saying that evil begins when you start treating people as objects. Yes, uh, and that's. I mean, Bratch was one of the great philosophers of our time. I have to say, he uh, loved that guy. But um, it, with, with in this case, we have in in real life there are are people we know losing family members and 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 losing their own lives and so on. And uh, other people are going, yeah, but I still want to go to the beach. And now I think that's yes. I know you want to go to the beach. I'd love to go and see my friends and my family. I haven't seen any family members in, in since February, in fact, and. It's, it's terrible. I miss them, but I'm not going to take a chance. I mean, I know I'm not infected, but I don't know that I'm not a carrier. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to take the chance. But so individually people are going, well, I'm fine. Therefore, everybody's going to be fine because they're only able to see things through their own eyes. Now, I'm not saying I'm better than those people because I think that doesn't need to be said. I think it's pretty obvious that I'm better than pretty much most people. But <laughs> <laughs> I really made it through humble. <laughs> But but it, it's sarcasm there. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we, if we extend that outwards, people go, well, yeah, but well, our group are better than their group. It's the herd mentality. The herd starts with the self, then it becomes the family, then it becomes the community and the the race or the nation or whatever or the mm -hmm. planet. Um, we're better than they are, and as long as we live, it's okay that they die. I mean, it's very sad, but at least it's not us. And and that's what we're seeing with the pandemic. We're going. I mean, I found myself looking at the figures in America going. Are they going to make it to 100,000? Oh, they're going to make it. Oh, hang on. No, they're people. Yeah. They're not just a number. Yeah. They're people. Mm -hmm. And even thinking like, oh my God, it's exciting. They just passed 100,000. And even thinking that it's terrible is self-forgetting that they're people. And yeah. that's 100,000 Like each families. person has a, a family around. That's it. That's it. That's that's just, there's a ripple. It's not that one person. That's rippling yeah. out to affect so many other people. Yeah. yeah. There's an Italian saying whereby... If one person dies, they kill a thousand people because they kill the people oh. they know, the people who are friends, yeah. the people who yeah. they could have met, the people yeah. they interacted with. So, yeah. Wow. And this is exactly why we want to write and read people centered fiction, isn't it? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Remind us that's for yeah. people. It's all about people. That's what we want to talk about. Right. We've got another one here from Neil. Uh, Mike, this might be a good one for you, actually. He's wondering how the Dread Universe is arbitrated. So many different writers and artists, so many different oh. stories and the history. Is there someone that actually is, you know, the keeper of the uh, the history? Because I know this happens, DC and Marvel do it with Batman um, or Spider-Man. There's bits where they'll tell a writer, yeah. you can't use that character because that character is currently being used in something else or yeah. this is contradicts something in the history or whatever. Is, yeah. is there someone who does the kind of gatekeeping on when someone's pitching a story no, and saying, that's a great story, Mike, but you can't do that because... yeah. Matt this. Smith is the editor of 2000 as the, um, he's basically the ultimate voice in this. Targ. He is the Targ, yeah. He's yeah, the Targ. Um, the, the mighty one. Um, <laughs> he decides, he doesn't look like this in real life, by the way. He's, he's much more handsome. Um, <laughs> Matt decides what can or can't be done. If I pitch a Judge Dredd um, story, mm. he will have a read and say yes. I mean, I pitch it as a, a, you know, a, a paragraph or two sometimes, just saying, oh, well, I want to do this, and he'll say yes. Um, 
so he is the ultimate say, but, but we're kind of all subservient to what John Magner, who created Dread and is still writing Dread, wants to do. If John decides that he wants to destroy Mega City 1, which he did uh, a few years ago. With well, the Dead, I have to correct you there. John once said that he didn't destroy Mega City 1. Someone asked him, why did you yeah. kill off half of the citizens? And he said, I didn't destroy Mega City 1. The Solves nuked it out. It wasn't me. So, <laughs> Those darn solves. <laughs> that was the words of the dread father himself. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But yeah, if, if John makes a decision, I swear like that will happen. That will have a knock-on effect. Yeah. Uh, we are well. Basically, we must follow in his his footsteps. But that's okay. They're, they're nice, big, comfortable footsteps. Those, those, those are good footsteps to follow in, though. I've got to yeah. say. Yeah, yeah. very well. So we have um, we, yeah, so there's a collective of a, a bunch of writers like me and um, other lesser writers. And they no, that's unfair. <laughs> um, so we 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 pre pitch stuff and Matt effectively will steer. But but now and again, um, some of us will talk to each other and say, "What are you working on? And how will that affect what I've got?" Mm. And so on. Um, but for the most part, we don't have the the big conclave every year like the DC Comics and Marvel do, where they sit sit down and they say, "Where are we? Where are we driving this? Where are we steering?" Yeah. It? Um, I'm not saying that there's no final destination, but that. There's no, uh, there's no captain to this boat. Um, we're all rowing. Some of us might not be rowing in the same direction, and a few of us <laughs> might be going around in circles. And as I'm sure there's a couple of guys who fell off and drowned, but uh, yeah, that's okay. Um, we we're going somewhere. Yeah, oh, we don't know. necessarily know where. Oh, we've got another one here in the questions. We've got one from James. James is wondering. Um, this is quite good. This is going back to what we were talking about earlier on about the. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're building the blank, you're filling in the blank spaces in the history of the judges. And we touched upon the fact that, well, how did the other countries get, you know, how did Britsit come to have judges, Africa judges? And he's asking, uh, James is asking, if you were going to bring those in, would you have to create, you know, a new fictional history for African countries, for instance, and how they coped after the atom war and, this, you know, their own judging system and everything else? Uh, and he's just asking if you would have to basically come up with a complete history to explain all of that. Yeah, I, I, I wonder, think if, I wonder if that would fit in actually to what you're doing. If at some point, I would, when you I, get further I, down the line in the judges I, series, I, that's something you might even do is outside I think America. It's never will run up against that wall and have to explain. Okay, this happened. This happened. This happened. This yeah. happened. Yeah, it, it's never really been detailed in any uh, any great length. I mean, I would love to be able to to take control of the whole judges um, yeah, series, if you like, and, and say pick someone like Joseph or, or Mora and say. Yeah. You have got this, spritz it, or, or whatever you want to do, and run with it. Um, as long as, of course, they were familiar enough with the comics that we didn't have any conflicts. Yeah, I mean, still got to fit into the, the, the Dreadverse, basically. Yeah. So, I mean, the there, are, there are a lot of blank spaces there to, to, to play with. I mean, There are, yeah, yeah. But that's okay. I mean, we, um, the, the great thing about blank spaces is that it is elbow room. Um, it is. We're not trying to fill in every single gap because that would be crazy. Um, we're not giving every character a backstory and everybody a, a tragic history. But what we're trying to do is is just highlights here and there. So that's why I say it. I suppose also if you started exploring some of the other ones, it's it's another good way of getting more diversity into the yeah. series yes. as well, because then you can yes. explore other countries that you don't often see. I mean, we mm -hmm. we see Britsit, we see the Solves a lot. I mean, a lot of the other ones they're, we're hinted at. We know they're there in the Dreadverse, but we don't see. Well, they've been to Asia, haven't they? Oh yeah. Yes, we've yeah. uh, seen Honda things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Australia, for instance, South Aus, America. Oh, we've we've, we've oh, seen some of the Oz judges before, haven't we? They were great in the uh, the Chopper series. Yeah. yeah. So we, we do need to explore yeah. further. I mean, we need to see what's happening in in Africa. But, and yeah. It would yeah, it would be interesting to see the African ones particularly. Yeah, that would be yeah. very interesting. Well, guys, coming up towards the end of our Ooh. bit here. Um, what a shame. shame. <laughs> you all start these things thinking we, we're going to be chatting for an hour. I hope we have enough material, and then you suddenly <laughs> look at your watch and you go, "Oh my God, we're." We're, we're nearly done. Um, so I'm afraid this is the point where normally we'd be saying to our nice audience, thank you guys for joining us. So okay. we'll say that to them. Yeah. But this is the point where we'd normally also be saying to them, well, you can join us in the signing room shortly and get your book <laughs> signed. And we can't do that this year, which is very annoying. I found myself yesterday at the event, event thinking this feels wrong to finish an event and not be going to the signing room. <laughs> Well, well it's in the pub. signing room, the pub. <laughs> yes, well, the, the, it's quite often the uh, that's the next stop afterwards. Uh, this time last year, we pretty much discovered that we drank the Pleasance dry because the bar in there wasn't 
quite, um, they weren't quite ready for uh, a bunch of science fiction readers and writers. <laughs> we were getting to the, the last day on Sunday and they were going, we're out of that, we're out of this, we're out of that. We're going, okay. <laughs> but we did have fun all the time. I've got to say thank you very much both to you guys for you. being good sports and coming in here. During Absolute the pleasure. I have to say thank you to our audience for joining us. And also, I think we should do a big shout out to the organizers at Kimura. Absolutely. Because, yes, well done. Yeah. You know, a couple of months ago, we were thinking, we're not going to have this. And look mm -hmm. what they put, they put an entire weekend of programs on. I think that is absolutely remarkable work by Anne and everybody at Kimura to put all of this on. And yeah. that's a nice way to end it. We didn't get to meet the lessons, but we did still get to have Kimura. And we got to talk about books and comics. So hey. I say that's a win. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maura, Joseph, oh, thanks, and Michael. Oh, and you thank you very much to everybody who joined us here. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.